April, okay. Okay. Uh, How do we want to start? Okay. Do we want to yeah. start with a question or we want to? No, we have to introduce, in. we have to introduce the episode. Oh, do it. Well, then. yes. Okay. So shh, shh, quiet, shh, 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 shh. quiet in the room. Okay. Um, welcome to this special episode to kick off our series in which we will release our 100th episode as Dig. Woo! Woo! We're really excited uh, to be joining you more or less live. I mean, people who are going to be listening to this uh, Sunday and thereafter will not be live, but we have some people who are in this room with us in this weird Zoom quarantine room uh, <laughs> who are like listening to this live action conversation. So our goal for today is to just sort of celebrate this special anniversary. We've been recording together now for um, three years, That's actually. Crazy. Today, I think, is our actual three-year anniversary since we switched up the or when we rebranded to to be Dig. Um, today is specifically today, May first. Really cool. How did that work oh, out? Look at that. That's I amazing. Yeah, because I plan all things ahead of time. <laughs> three three years. That is insane. That, three years. One hundred episodes is insane. One hundred episodes. Yeah. So I'm very is, tired just thinking about it. I know, right? So uh, thanks to those of you, Colin, Elizabeth, and Leah, for joining us today in this uh, live recording. And we're just going to talk about, uh, we're going to answer questions that uh, listeners have submitted ahead of time. So Sarah, kick us off. Can I ask my own question first? Is this the first time we've ever had folks join us like in the room to listen? Yeah. To listen, Yes. I don't think we've ever had like uh, a live audience before. A live audience before, yeah. <laughs> no, I'm, this is I'm the very first. nervous. This is the first. Um, <laughs> don't f up. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no cursing. Okay. Brought to you by the COVID nineteen pandemic. The only thing I say is swears. That's true. What, Avril? Avril, are you all right? Sorry, my dog just came racing down the stairs like a fucking bat out of hell. <laughs> As she so curses. actually, that is like very on brand that we have at some point a dog. Your dog, specifically yes. your dog. <laughs> True. <laughs> In an episode somewhere. All right. Are we ready yeah. for our first real question? This Do is it. a very difficult question. How did you all meet? Who wants to go first? <laughs> well, Mer or Sarah, you were the first at the university, so you should probably lead us off. Oh, the first at UB, you mean? Yeah. You were oh, there God. before any of us. I've been at UB for like my entire life and I'm never leaving. Uh, hopefully, anyway. Um, I don't know. I started in 2011. Is that when you started the master's me? program? Yeah. No. I started the master's program in 2007. Yeah. I started I'm the old. PhD in 2010, man. Yeah. Mm, so. Okay. Um, no, no, no. Okay. I would have been 2009. I started my master's. Never mind. You were first. Because uh, I'm very old. Um, very old. So I met. Averill at some point during our PhD orientation. Mm -hmm. um, but I was very standoffish. I will put the blame on me for a long time. I was, I was really, I don't know. I was, I, I don't think I make <laughs> friends particularly quickly or I used to. Um, I was very standoffish. I was one of, I think, I think I was at the time the only uh, graduate student in our department who had kids had kid at the time, which seems like a dream. I wish I only had kid right now. I have multiple kids. Um, <clears throat> but so we didn't really hang out. We ran the um, GHA or you ran the GHA and I just showed up the stuff for a while. Um, 2011. That was the year yeah. that Marissa mm -hmm. started. And then we sort of became friends. W actually, once we really, once we got into the dissertation phase um, and we had to sort of lean on each other more for you know that kind of writing support and we started our writing group and everything marissa i met <laughs> no, I wait, 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 wait let me do my because oh, i go ahead first. i met marissa first yes i because i didn't meet you i no. didn't meet you for a while no marissa the summer before she was going to start the phd program which was two years after sarah and i started she sent me yeah. this email Oh no. Asking if we Oh my could, god, is she are you pulling the email up or something cuz that No, I don't have that email anywhere. She sent me right. an email asking if we could meet because she was really nervous about the program and she just wanted to like get a feel for what to expect. So we met at Barnes and Noble and she talked for a thousand years. <laughs> 
on brand as they Very. say. Yep. And I knew from that moment that here we had something special, <laughs> a budding friendship <laughs> with uh, me being Shut a up, Except I had a baby with me and Abril was like, ew, what is that thing? That I, did, for I me? did think that, but I didn't say it out loud. True. Yeah. Yeah. So I met Abril first and then I met Sarah kind of through hanging out with Abril. Yeah. Um, I was going to say we, we met at one of the GHA meetings. Um, yeah. Excuse me, GHA picnic. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, because you asked me some question. I had Emma there, and you asked me some really weird, <laughs> some really weird like breastfeeding question or something. And I was like, "Oh, you were like, oh, isn't she walking by now or something?" And I was like, "What?" I can't. and I was like, I remember being like, "This bitch." <laughs> <laughs> oh, I remember. I said, "I was like, is she sitting up yet?" And you were like, "No." She um, was. I don't know how she was. Like, what I don't it know, was. four months old or something. I was like, "What are you crazy?" Mm. I wasn't um, trying to be one of those people. I was just. But see, I didn't know Marissa then, and now if Marissa asked me that, I'd be like, "It's just Marissa." Yeah. Um, but yeah, and then we became friends pretty quickly because we had the kid thing in common. Um, and then in the background of all of this, because yes. Elizabeth, you must have started. I the started the started. master's program in 2012, I think. Right, yeah. So the same year that Marissa started the PhD, but you were like this tall, beautiful, <gasps> glamorous, yes, like quiet, yes. but also powerful, mm-hmm. sort of goth she rockabilly. Like, and I'd be like, oh my God, she's <laughs> so beautiful. Find this goddess who just like walks in and out of the grad lounge while we're all yeah. sitting in there, like eating our snacks and gossiping and crying. Yeah. And, and she had like those, you know, bangs. All the, the bangs. like Betty Page bangs. Oh yeah. my god! Oh my god! Y'all are making me feel like embarrassed. No, or, no. it was no, great. It was we were like, like, we were like, damn! I used to did be hot, and now. <laughs> well, and I talked to you. Do you remember me talking to you in the hallway? Like I just, because I just don't, I don't mind talking to anybody. So I was just like, hey, what's up? What's your name? And you said something like, well, I have kids or something. And I was like, oh, I do too. And you're like, oh, okay. And then we talked for a bit. Um, I don't know if you remember that. I was sitting right I don't remember that. I I, I I remember meeting you in our colonial Latin American seminar. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, we all met. So oh, my grad long school. story yeah. short, to summarize that long and boring <laughs> and winding story is that we all met at the grad program at UB at University yeah. of Buffalo yeah. while we worked on our PhDs. Yeah. But I and think we formed some yeah. sort of like mommy cult or something. Yeah. Um, we've no. been I mean, the mommy cult. No, and we eight. weren't really because April hates kids. So I yeah. hate children. Plus one. Yeah. I don't know please you're all my cult that's what the important thing is <laughs> we worship but it, at the altar of ave <laughs> it's interesting though how um you know you look at that i look at that time and it doesn't like going through it it didn't seem like a very long time uh you know as you're kind of experiencing it and now looking back i'm like oh my gosh like avril you and i started graduate school together 10 years ago Shh, don't um or almost 10 years ago right and so it's interesting to think that like there were times where the four of us were not friends or, or we were maybe acquaintances. Like we saw each other at like, you know, yeah. Presser, uh, I don't Presser think it was until conference. the podcast that we, yeah. that we all became friends. Not, no, I don't think so either. Like we, yeah. we knew each other. I mean, we knew each other and some of us were closer than others, but like Elizabeth, especially like, I had never really had a conversation with you. I don't right. think a real conversation well, until we started. And for me, and I know to an extent for some of y'all, like going through grad school, you know, I'm almost a decade older than most grad students. So it was just a whole different, right. You know, I just wasn't interested in hanging out necessarily. Yeah. With, you know? Yeah. No. And, and, floor and drinking beer. <laughs> right. And that's why I say like on that. at the beginning, I was, I was probably standoffish. I think part of that was self-protection because I did have a kid and I was afraid of um, people, I don't know, judging that, especially April. <laughs> Please, you didn't um, know I hated children until long after <laughs> Until she took friends. Friends. No, I think it had more to do with you just seemed like such a powerhouse um, that I thought there was no way that I could ever kind of keep up. But, um, you know, you, it's, my experience anyway was very, was similar, Elizabeth, you know, you, you have kids and your, your life you're kind is of at a different, different life stage. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Right. But I'll drag you along. You can keep up cause you'll be, I'm going to hold you by the hand and pull you. It's true. We're done. 
She doesn't give you an option. True. All right. Um, this question actually kind of goes along with that question. I tried to, <laughs> I tried to like put them in chronological order. Um, how did you get started? So I'm, I'm interpreting that question to mean, how did we get started as a Dig. podcast? How did we yeah. get started as Dig specifically? Um, although we do have a little bit of a longer history than that, but yeah. How did we get started? How do we get started? Well, in 2015, 2015, I put out a call on that damn grad listserv and uh, some people responded and among them was this magnificent enigma unicorn called Elizabeth Garner Masaryk and then my two buddies, mm -hmm. Marissa and Sarah. Well, actually, Marissa and Sarah did not respond to the email. No, they did not. <laughs> they did not respond. Read and then I was like, oh. Let's serve emails, okay? I have yeah. too much to do. Listen, I was like, I was I like texted 900 and I said, oh, months we're, pregnant. Shh, quiet. We're going we're gonna to start a podcast. We're going to record this. And Marissa and Sarah were like, oh, we want to be part of that. Include us. And so then I did include them in the following emails. And then we started just like playing around with audio and what kind of things we liked to listen to as podcast listeners. And we started making episodes and they were like bad for a year. And then they were kind of good for a year. And then we branched off and started dig in 2017. And it has been really good because we were made for this life. Yes. Word. Yeah. I mean, I think that um, one of the things that was, was different going into dig um after our first project was that we had had we kind of shut things down um and instead we kind of took this um sort of we took the summer off right before we released mm -hmm. our first episodes yeah, yeah. and that gave us a ton of time to meet and really talk through what we wanted to be and what we wanted to do yeah. so that when we did launch in the fall we had like a very clear um, had like a business plan you yeah, know? exactly. We had a, a clear sort of vision of, of what kind of podcast we were and what kind of history we wanted to do and how we were going to be organized. All things that we had not done right. <laughs> the first time around. Well, right. So in giving advice to people who are thinking about starting some kind of project like this, start one, learn your learn and make your mistakes and yeah. then <laughs> do the real thing. <laughs> yeah, yeah sure. like a garbage one, a garbage practice right. one. <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah. And that's why um for those of you who um listen, you know, sort of or have listened for a long time, sometimes you'll see us like re-release an episode. That's because a lot of times it's an episode that we really loved, but we did so long ago that we did it like before we were trans having transcriptions or having copy that we could post um, or before we had microphones like we have now. Right. So we were or or like, before we had people who would actually do the work they were supposed to do to prepare to do the episode. Well, right. that too. Um, but, uh, you know, so every once in a while we're like, oh, like recently Frankenstein, right? We were like, oh man, Frankenstein was such a great episode. And it made us sad to think that it was kind of out there, but nobody was listening to it because the audio was so bad and the organization was terrible. So like it, it's been kind of cool in recent days to take what we know now and take those old episodes and kind of revamp them and re-release them. Yeah, I do remember recording Frankenstein the first time in Sarah's guest room closet, the yeah. me, Sarah and Marissa mm -hmm. in that. And I even farted at one point too. Yes, it which was terrible. Is like, really? <laughs> and if was... I recall, if I recall correctly, there was also two breastfeeding infants in that room mm -hmm. with us. Who were just like, it, who were just like lying. Every once you know. in a while, there'd be like a <laughs> <laughs> yeah. noise. <laughs> yep. Of a baby being like rooting around for a exactly. boob or something. And then we'd have to stop and April would be like, oh my God, kids are so disgusting. And then we'd yep. start again. Yep. Yeah. These are facts. We don't record like that anymore. <laughs> we do not. That's well. why we record with my dog in my house because there's right. no children yeah. here. Yeah. Yeah. Ave, keep making sure you're you're facing the microphone when you talk. I hear your voice going in and out. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah see? Yeah. You're the big boss. See, lady you're not telling perfect us either. What to do. Jerk. Right. All right. Um, anything else about how we started that you guys want to reflect on the, the first, like the beginning? No, I mean, our first project, what, um, history buffs was really, you know, I think, I mean, I'm proud of that despite the fact that we turned out some subpar stuff. Um, I think we were we just babies. A, yeah. And we did a really good job of, 
like figuring out what the heck we were doing. Right. Um, yeah, we had zero experience, zero training. We just dove in head first and figured it out along the way. Right. Yeah. And I think it was a really tough call to to kind of end that project and start a new one. But I am really glad that we did. Um, during that transitional period was a bit, um, there's a lot of, there's some drama and, and it was just difficult to end that project and to start yeah, a new like one. Like it would be any kind of, you know, yeah, any kind any of venture. Yeah. We were breaking up the band. Yeah. But I'm glad that. Go on we, a solo act with four mm-hmm, people. Mm-hmm. That's not really solo. Behind the music. <gasps> Except in behind the music, it's always like, and then the Beatles broke up, and Paul McCartney started Wings. <laughs> like, it's not, yeah, not great. Isn't it always like, oh, it's Yoko Ono's fault? That's like the main because it's always the woman's fault. Right? Of that, yeah. Um, um I, okay, I was next. I can't remember what I was gonna say. Oh, I, I, I just I I think very fondly of the kind of very beginning of Dig partly because we had that really fun day where we were like, we need to have a photo shoot. So we have promotional <laughs> oh, images. Yeah. We all went to Elizabeth's house and like, we were all dressed to the nines and like took a bunch of pictures and um, we should probably do that again. We, <laughs> we really should that. update <laughs> that. Um, but it was just, it was really exciting and it was really fun to start this project and to have so many ideas bouncing around. And um, what I think is really great is that that um that was three years ago and we still have that energy you know we still have that commitment to the project and sometimes we're like oh fuck my life it's copy week but at the same time you know i i wouldn't trade that Mm -mm. i'm always glad when it's written and done (laughs) (laughs) we can be more enthusiastic after the copy is written uh during copy week less so yeah i mean i think i'm kind of different in that i of course often don't have time to do copy week. So I'm like freaking out, like how am I going to make this happen? But I genuinely enjoy writing it for some reason. Yeah. Like even when I'm really stressed out, obviously you all enjoy looking into the topics you look into, but um, when you're really stressed out, sometimes it's not enjoyable because you can't right. relax and enjoy it. And for some reason, it's always been an escape to me. I mean, especially when I was trying to not write my dissertation, I'd be like, Oh yeah, I'm going to do this mm-hmm. episode about whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's nice to be able to get out of our little, I don't know, academic boxes sometimes. Absolutely. Yeah, definitely. Nope. I don't agree. I hate writing. <laughs> Elizabeth's I hate like, it. nope, I want to be in my box. Every <laughs> word is just like pried out of me with like cold, slimy hands. Yeah, we have different <laughs> really, approaches. It's really difficult for me. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's just how it's just how we're different, you know? And Elizabeth's like really good at the businessy side and being like, I don't know, professional and having a filter and all of these the adult test. things that I don't know how to do. Word. Yeah. Next. Okay. <clears throat> how did you guys juggle completing your PhDs and writing, recording, and editing a podcast? <laughs> I mean, okay. So I just defended almost a month ago. Thank you. Yay! And so uh, about exactly a year ago now, like I was ready to quit. I was ready to quit it all. I was ready to walk away. Like it was just a really low point. Um, and I think that happens a lot of time in like people's third year or like that next to last year. It's like, there's just this breakthrough you have to make. And then to, mm. once, you know, once I pushed through that, it all just kind of came out. And honestly, for the last year I have shut down. I, I had to get off social media. I had to get off everything. And because I knew I wasn't going to finish if I didn't. Yeah. Um, so for me, maybe it wasn't a balance at all. It was like, <laughs> for, for the past year, it's just been academia. So I don't know if I've been I'm the best person to say. Right. It's more of like a sprint and then a walk yeah. instead of just a steady job. But, you know, in a way, I mean, for all of us, you know, it is a marathon and like some weeks are copy Let's week. See, see how far we can push this analogy. Yeah. But, you know. <laughs> Some week is copy week and it's like, that's all you do for three or four days. You're just writing straight your copy because the deadline is Saturday night, you know, and you have no other choice. Right. And then other times, some of us will write one for a month or two, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. yeah. Well, I think, I think oh, um, go ahead. I think one way that we all, both, both in finishing the PhD and just like being early career 
faculty now is one one way we juggle is by a lot of episodes that we put out have something to do with a chapter or an article or a, a lecture a, a lecture right Th that they were drawing from what we are doing in the other sprints and marathons of our lives mm -hmm. um, and that makes completing the copy a little bit easier for the other stuff like the editing and the recording day and the you know back end blog creation transcript posting and the social media stuff that's just we just have to do it it just mm -hmm. it just is part of the package at this point um so but the at least in terms of putting together an episode there's a lot of times where we can just it, it can be part of what we're doing elsewhere mm -hmm. oh i'm gonna be 100 percent that bitch and say that i think one of the reasons i can do it is because i have a really supportive partner and i mean if i had a husband who like i don't know had an ego or like felt like um you know i don't know felt like this time wasn't worth it or whatever or felt like i should be you know the woman taking care of the kids and he, he should be able to fuck off and do whatever if i had a partner like that i don't know if i could do it um obviously I don't really my see you married to a partner like that no you're, i don't even, you're, no. you're like talking about yeah. hypotheticals that yeah a hypothetical <laughs> complete asshole but yeah just some stupid incel but um no i'm just saying um i have a partner who I think admires what I do and is impressed by what I do because he couldn't do it um, even if he tried. So he is 99% of the time really supportive and doesn't give me shit. Like tomorrow is his birthday and he's working tomorrow. So today is his only day off around the time of his birthday. And I'm not eating dinner with my family or spending time with them. I'm down here doing whatever. And he's, yeah. he's, he's okay with it. He's just hanging out upstairs, you know, that kind of thing. Like, he makes it so that, um, I don't know, I guess I can be kind of a crappy wife and or mom sometimes, or, you know, this is how I feel. Um, they give me a lot of grace, I guess is what I'm saying. Oh, Flexibility. So nice. I know. <laughs> no, I think that's a really important point that, you know, um, a lot of this is accomplished because we have, you know, people who are willing to let us pursue the things that we want to pursue uh, and you know that said i have had i have had arguments with my husband before where he's been like oh well you're just going to play with your friends mm -hmm. because we are friends and so it can very easily look like we're not actually this is not actually work this is not actually labor mm -hmm. um and I think that that's, it's not just, I mean, I, I think it's easy to say that about the podcast, but it's easy to say that about lots of academic work, right? That like, because we're not digging a ditch, it doesn't look yeah. like we're working, right? Yeah. Um, oh, right. Yeah. And we're and doing so it from can, home a lot of times. Yeah. And so when I'm like, well, I have to go to Averill's house for six hours today. I think that that <laughs> sometimes can be, you know, like it, it, it makes sense to me. I don't, I don't buy it and I don't let him get away with it. But I, you know, it makes sense to me that at some points when, you know, you're frustrated, you might be like, well, you're just going to hang out with your friends all day. And I'm like, you don't understand. This is that that's not actually what this is. I mean, it is what it is. Cause like we do take a break and like eat soup together, but like <laughs> we're also working. <laughs> um, but I mean, I always, I actually always dread this question. This is a question that I get all the time when I go talk about dig or lots of other things. Um, but I don't like to answer it because my answer is usually not the right one, which is that I, I work too much, probably. Um, mm -hmm. Sorry if you can hear that. That's my stupid dog barking because it's dinner time and my children are ignoring him. Um, but I, I probably work too much and I probably work when I should be hanging out with my kids. I mean, all of my kids right now are in the basement watching TV because I was like, don't even talk to me right now. Go away. Right? So like... Mm -hmm in a way that's probably not the best thing. Like I should be, uh, there's I some about, scenario like, in which yeah. I should be like, I only record after I make multi-course meals for my family <laughs> and like make, and I'm like, I, I, I don't or know. Like maybe. I set up my children with, you know, homeschooling tasks and then right. I went or, and nipped out and recorded for a while. Yeah. No. And I, I, that's not, that's not how I function. But that also, like you said, Marissa, like that, um, 
that was part of the deal from the beginning with me that, Mm -hmm. um, we, my husband and I both said we wanted to have lots of kids and I'm holding up my end of the bargain. If you could see me, you would know. Um, but also that, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to work and I'm going to work all the time. Think, and I'm thankful I have a different kind of partner, but, um, my partner is also someone who's very driven and very ambitious. And so we think a lot alike in that way. We understand, you know, when it's a Saturday night and I'm writing copy and he's writing hearing reports, you know, we're just, that's how, that's how we are, you know? Yeah. So. I think my situation is different in that my husband is not ambitious and, and I don't mean that as a criticism. He would say that about himself. He, right. he wants to be a stay at home dad and never, ever have to leave the house at the end. That's like what his, he wants I would his life die. to be. <laughs> and I know. So, what, and, and he knows that. So I told him before we had kids, like, I can't be staying home all the time. Like I will lose my mind. I yeah. am not a homebody. I need to be out of the house and you know, um, I am ambitious and I'm always working on the next big thing and that's what it's going to be like. And so even though I think Sarah and James, um, have that in common, my husband and I are complete opposites in that sense. And we kind of compliment each other. It sounds very corny, but it works for us, I guess. Yeah. Next question. Sure. Okay. Um, <clears throat> wait, this is a, Sarah, oh. did Elizabeth not answer? Oh no, you did it at the bit. beginning. Okay, cool. Oh, she had a very good answer. Yeah. I, I like it. She's always on point. I don't know. She it's is. Just a thing that she can do. <laughs> <laughs> I like this question a lot and I'm really interested in everybody's responses to it because I sort of know where people are going to where people what people are going to say, but I'm interested in hearing you guys articulate it. Okay. <laughs> when when researching Do you guys always interpret sources the same way or do you sometimes have debates? And so I'm actually going to add sort of a, like an addendum to that question, which is like, what, um, what sort of perspective do you take when you're putting together an episode? Like, how do you think about framing an episode? I think we each do that differently. Yeah, we each. So the fact that we we are each writing and researching our own episodes, we're not working on episodes together necessarily, means that there isn't necessarily a ton of times when we come up against that potential conversation. But, you know, there have been times when, like, we'll be reading something and some, and I'll say, you know, X, Y, and Z according to this source. And then someone will be like, oh, is that is that what that means? Um, Or like when Sarah and I had like this passive aggressive sub debate about the usefulness of talking about the walking dead as an analogy for, I don't know, (laughs) some fucking disease and something. I don't even know what we're talking about. I, you know, like it was, it went on for a really long time. I ended up cutting it out of the episode because it was just ridiculous. Um, It's a useful analogy. (sighs) Sure. Okay. Sure. I think um, most of our debates and conversations um, come about when we are putting the series together, not when we're putting our episodes together. Um, and that always, um, usually I'm complaining about something or wanting to change something because that's what I do. And Sarah's saying, man, it'll be fine because that's what Sarah does. <laughs> and um, then Avril just says, well, we're doing this. And then I do it. And so I think that would be when we have debates, like what should the shape of the series be? So if we're doing, um, you know, another sex series or whatever, a couple of people will say, Hey, I'm going to do this because I have to teach it next fall and I want to do double duty and, you know, double dip on this. And, um, then another one of us will say, well, we wanted to do this, but it's, there's too much American stuff going on. So I'll do something totally different, that sort of thing. But we try to get coverage and then we also try to have them co coheed, coheed. What's the, why can't I think of the word? Cohere? Cohesive? Cohere. Cohere. Cohere is the word I was, I, I talk faster than I think. So, um, we want them to go here. Uh, but we also want there to be some diversity and, you know, we have a lot of things that, we want some to be kind of like deep dives and then we want others to be more surveys. There's a lot of stuff going on there. So when we decide what we're going to focus on and we pick our episodes um, revolving around whatever theme we've chosen, I think that's when most of that discussion and debate comes, Mm -hmm. comes in. I think every once in a while we will run into something 
and I wish that I could come up with a great example right now and I can't, but where, especially between Marissa and I, where I'm like, <laughs> this thing happened in the 19th century and oh, it yeah. was very important. And Marissa's like, fuck that. It already happened in the 18th century. <laughs> <laughs> You know, like, no, 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 no. People, people were doing that a hundred years before that. You're such a 19th century American. <laughs> I, I've definitely <laughs> learned more about early modern anything Absolutely. than I ever would have learned had I not done this podcast. Yes. And medieval. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, that, yeah, I think that's just one of my things is like, you know, I don't pretend to be a 19th century expert or uh, an, a, an expert on, you know, 19th century American history or gilded age progressive era like elizabeth like i'm not they know more than me about that stuff 100 percent um but i guess i just get um annoyed i think when you're um in academia if you're not an americanist you are whatever you are and then everything else so we have americanists who teach american history and then you have right and then you have have europeanists who teach european history and world history that's just kind of how it's set up in the united states because we're american so american history is what is of most interest to people. Um, so because of that, Avril and I are always trying to get the two of them to expand their, their, I don't know. Yeah, no, I think that's fair. I horizons, mean, right. Um, one of the things that we decided to do right from the beginning was to, to do understudied topics or at least not understudied topics, but topics that don't show up on history podcasts. Right. Um, mm-hmm. And as part of that, that means having, uh, a global focus. That means that not every series can have something from the eight, mid 19th century, something from the Gilded Age Progressive Era, something from 18th century England, and something from 20th century Ireland. Like that's not sustainable, and nobody it, it'd be boring. I mean, although I say that, and there are people out there who like, sorry, fans who like listen to you know 15 hour long podcasts about one pope, right? So yeah, I know <clears throat> there's an audience for everything. But, um, yeah, I, I think that, uh, we've all learned to push our own sort of specialty boundaries a little bit. And that's, that's only helped me. That's Mm -hmm. made me a better teacher by far. Mm -hmm. Um, so can I ask too, though, in terms of, I mean, that was kind of interpreting, but like what, um, how do each of us go about kind of conceiving of an episode? Like, um, how you'll put it together because each of us, I think, do that differently. I don't know. I think I tend to go, let me see all the things that might mention this one thing that I'm kind of interested about. And mm-hmm. then I try to pull all that together into some sort of cohesive narrative um, successfully or unsuccessfully. Mm-hmm. Yeah, like you'll take sort of a a question that you have, like, yeah. where did the term le petit more come from? Mm-hmm. And you'll go through 15 sources or 20 sources or 25 sources trying to answer that question. You yeah, don't know I, the yeah. answer to it when you start off. I, I almost never do the thing where you take a book and then build your narrative out of that the way that I think Elizabeth and Sarah do a lot. I do, I do that. Opposite. I do that a lot. We yeah. do inductive they do yes. deductive. She says this all the time. I still Marissa don't the likes to make up words. I no, like those are real like words. Half and half. Um, because you know, sometimes I just find a book and I'm like, I yeah. want to center a podcast around this. And then right. other times I have a whole bunch of Yeah. You know, no, you're definitely sources. a mixed bag. I wouldn't say yeah. that you are more like Sarah. Particularly one or the other, but Avril and I I think are pretty yeah. similar. And a lot of that has to do with the fact that we don't teach American history necessarily. So we have to be generalists. So I think that's where that comes from. We, that's exactly what I do. I have like, I mean, for the last episode we just recorded, I printed off cause I had to print them on my own printer and with my own paper and my own toner. Um, I printed off like 18 different articles and then I had like three or four eBooks um, yeah. And I read probably half of those articles entirely, skimmed the others, and skimmed the ebooks. Whereas, I mean, even when we use one book, we're not only using no, one book. No, right, right, right. Like, I'm we not, might, we oh, might no, I was, <laughs> frame it with one book and then have right. like 10 articles and three other books that we're Right, starting. but you're starting with the idea that, that you get from the book, right? Mm-hmm. No, I'm not saying that we do more work. I'm saying that we're starting with all of these very disparate things and mm-hmm. trying to create 
a narrative that wasn't already there. And then you're starting with a narrative that was already there and trying to deepen it and explore mm -hmm. it in different ways. It's just a different way of, yeah. of writing episodes. Yeah. I mean, I, I usually, uh, I often have started from one book because for, for, for whatever reason I have the book on my nightstand or it's like, I really need to like, for instance, when we did the ghost dance episode, I just, I just wanted to know more about that. Like I didn't actually have a reason for it necessarily. Mm -hmm. um, but then once I got into it, I found one book that just like sort of blew my mind and it ended up really focusing on that, even though I did bring in lots of other things. But then other times I think, and I think the episodes end up just because of the way I write end up kind of all looking very similar. But um, like just the episode that we did, um, what even did I do? I can't remember. Oh, VD. Um, in the military, that was like Marissa said. That was many articles and yeah. several different books, um, different but it stuff, still yeah. is like very tightly focused on one thing, and so it's still kind of guided by a, a narrative that I already have in my mind a little bit. Um, but it's kind Sarah of Sarah has a very organized brain that works. I don't know if that's true. But I think um, you do. <clears throat> you, you put everything in this kind of un unified sort of narrative that just, everything just makes sense. And then I think I'm a little bit more like all this crazy shit that doesn't relate to each other. How am I going to make it relate? Like, it's just a different way of thinking, I think. And I think that this is interesting because this is true of our scholarship too. Like all four oh, yeah. of us have very different ways that we approach our own writing and our scholarship. And like, I am just, I I'm very narrative driven. I like I like stories and I like having things sort of told in that way. And so my episodes end up being kind of that same sort of story focused, I guess. Um, I think whereas, that, also, that also might be discipline focused because like I tried to do that for the last article that I wrote and the reviewer who outside reviewer was like, no, <laughs> no. yeah. No, and and you're absolutely more, right. you more, an, 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 you know, like analytical section. Yeah. And I'm That's like, how oh, Europeanists don't want that. They don't want yeah, some kind of right. narrative. They want very, very analytical. They want statistics. They want, I think it has to do with the availability of source material. I mean, we're dealing with hundreds of extra years of bureaucratic records and crap going on in Europe than we actually have in the United States. So I think it has to do with the, the availability of source material and then just how the cultures of those particular fields have ended up. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And I do both. I do I do comparative. So I do both and both tell me that I suck, you know, for one reason or another, not that I suck, but both have criticisms that go against each other. And it's like, okay, well, split the baby in half, I guess. I don't know. Sorry. I'm talking to Ross Perot. Okay. <laughs> I think so, now you have to explain that. Yeah, I think <laughs> my as one does. My uh my summon senior seminar is um is playing a reacting to the past game centered on the debates around the Vietnam memorial. And so because we are asynchronous, it's happening on Slack and my students tend to wake up round about two. <laughs> right. <laughs> so like just as I'm ready to like, okay, it's time to end the day, they're like, let's have a fierce debate on Slack. <laughs> It's Actually, really I have my students are doing um, react reaction to the past, um, just like a, it's called. It's about the Battle of Jumonville Glen, and um, they have a six o'clock deadline. So just now they delivered the French delivered terms of um, surrender to the English, and I'm supposed to say things, and they're all waiting for me. But they'll have to wait. It's fine. It'll be fine. All right, are we ready for another question? Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> this one's funny. Um, can you give a future history exam question about today's current political situation that five years ago would have sounded like a satirical piece on SNL? For example, which president advised drinking bleach during a global pandemic? <laughs> Was that Nixon? <laughs> Can I tell a really quick story? I had my students do some of those implicit bias tests that Harvard does. I don't know if you've ever heard. It's called Project Implicit. And I had them do these tests to kind of gauge some of their 
implicit biases in my digital humanities class. And one of the implicit biases was political figures, but the only choices were Trump and Nixon. And so my student was like, my results said that I slightly favor Trump over Nixon. And I was like, those are your only two choices out of all the people, you know, out of all the political figures in U.S. history. They're like, let's compare Trump and Nixon and see who you like more. I mean, Nixon, obviously. Nixon Nixon was actually a great president. What are you talking about? Well, he's my favorite president. Calm down. I actually have a friend who, hopefully she'll listen to this, but she's very, she's like, she's one of the most liberal people I know. And she loves Richard Nixon. No, I mean. I love because he was Nixon. great on some stuff. Yeah, <laughs> on like some, the EPA, some stuff. The EPA, some stuff. EPA, <laughs> the EPA also, like, Native American rights. China. Yeah. yeah, creep. Come on, that's a really great acronym. Like that's, that's true. Good. That's true. Let's- anyway, <laughs> sorry, um, um, dorking out. But you know, I this this actually raises for me. I will answer the question, but this raises for me the fact that it is really you can believe this fucking hard to do a podcast where we focus on the topics that we focus on and try to keep it unpolitical or non-political or apolitical or however you phrase that. Um, and we've gotten blowback for that. Like people, when, whenever we do have something that intersects and sometimes we do it on purpose and sometimes we don't, we have a topic that intersects with something that's happening. Right. Um, people will be like, you guys are feminist, <laughs> you know, liberal you social feminazis, justice warriors. Social justice warriors, yeah. Um, and I think a certain level of that would come either way, just because we are women, mm-hmm. um, and we talk about the topics we talk about, which are inherently political. You can't right. talk about them and and um, have them be unbiased or unpolitical. But um, it's it's tricky because sometimes we'll write an episode. Like, for instance, that that rape in early America episode that I did, I wrote that while I was steaming hot with rage over the Kavanaugh hearings. Like, uh, every every paragraph writing that made me want to cry. Um, but then in delivering it, I had to sort of uh, put that episode together in a way that didn't make it all about Kavanaugh because that's not a responsible way necessarily to do history. We can draw parallels. We can talk about what we can learn, but we can't be like, isn't this exactly like Brett Kavanaugh? Because it was 200 years ago or something. Right. Right. Um, If I was going to write a future history exam question based on things that were happening today, my, I can't say exactly what it would be, but it would have to do with masculinity. Mm. and the role that masculinity is playing like at this exact moment in the way that this administration is handling this pandemic. Um, I was really struck the other day by Mike Pence's decision not to wear a mask. And I think a lot of that comes from a certain Trumpian brand of manhood um, and the performance of manhood particularly. Mm. So I look forward to someday reading that dissertation. Somebody's going to write a killer dissertation on this. You're so smart. <laughs> it won't be me. <laughs> I think mine would be also s- similar or just about gender relations, probably something about, about incels um, yeah. and the, the ridiculous um, sort of idea of involuntary celibacy and how it is um, statistically correlated with violence and also associated with white nationalism and all of that stuff. Um, And uh, yeah, I think my question, I I can't exactly (laughs) articulate what that question would be, Um, but it would be about that. I mean, and I think that future historians will probably be able to argue that this is a crisis in masculinity that's happening um, that is specific to um, the, I don't know, technological age or whatever people are going to call this, like when computers transform society. I don't know. Um, uh, And look at, you know, Reddit things of, of incels who, you know, were planning to rape women and shit like that. And look back and say like, what in the world is going on here? And how did, you know, did that work? And also Facebook and Twitter algorithms and bots um, taking over Facebook, all of that kind of stuff. 
I just had a, a like something that was removed as hate speech because I said that men don't wash their hands and that they suck. And <laughs> Facebook was like, absolutely not. That's unacceptable. Um, but I was commenting on an article by a public health official who said that women shouldn't do the shopping during COVID because they take too long. And, you know, so that I responded to that and Facebook was like, absolutely not. Your anti-man stuff is not welcome here, right? Um, those sorts of ways of policing people's behaviors, I think, will be something that sounds absolutely ridiculous in the future um, when we ask them and test questions. <laughs> Elizabeth, Averill? I don't know. I don't know if I'm clever enough for that right now. I, th I, I, I think both of you have said really good things. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, my question would probably be not so satirical as real because i i want to know how students five years from now think that the covid pandemic and the subsequent like quarantining and all that will have changed society or not changed society like yeah how how roaring 20s are we going to be in 2025 like mm -hmm. it, <clears throat> is this going to be and like how austerity is some folks are going to go and decadence are some folks are going to go and like what the fuck is going to happen right in the next five years yeah yeah well and of course bringing in questions of government and like you know are we looking are we going to have some kind of governmental revolution like during the per depression and the you know the new deal or mm -hmm. or right are we going to go the opposite and go green new deal the way of austerity and right no i think those are really good questions i mean i think that's also why we're seeing like five bajillion op-eds right now being right. written by every historian that has time yeah including we um trying to think about those questions right like are we going to have a the dance macabre of 2000 21 right or um the great gatsby sort of approach to life or um one of the things that i've been thinking a lot about was i had grandparents who were raised during the great depression and one was a, a straight up hoarder mm -hmm. um and the other just like saved every plastic butter container that he ever encountered because they were mm -hmm. useful right are we washing was... ziploc baggies uh, which i do yeah i do that, well, too. do that too. Um, okay you're all lunatics but but, just, but, but that expensive. was an experience that, that <laughs> they got through. that was an experience just they went through little tiny ones, then. kids right yeah and that um got into their bones in some sort of way right uh and affected the rest of their lives in in kind of small silly ways but in big profound ways too so i'm really interested in a I, i'm interested and I'm also kind of sad to think about, you know, when my kids are adults in 20 mm -hmm. years, like what will, what will their memories of this time period be and how yeah. will it have impacted their lives, the way that they live day to day, right? Yeah. Although That's upsetting I think to me, you, too. neither of your children will have experienced what your grandparents experienced in terms of scarcity, right? Cause oh, no. Right. no, oh, we, absolutely we not. all have, we all still have jobs right now. Like we have mm -hmm. paychecks, but there are many many families in this country right now absolutely that, yeah. right yeah i can't fill up a cart at the grocery store with like 200 dollars worth of groceries to stock right. up right they're like yeah. they've got the little hand basket and they've got a gallon of milk and a loaf of bread if they were lucky enough to find mm -hmm. one and maybe a couple of cans right and like, twelve hundred dollars from the trump administration to you know to shop on right sure yeah my real question though is going to be is 2021 the year for me to start my cult <laughs> we do sure. want to start a call but i'm gonna join it and then we're gonna go live on a commune somewhere yes. in rural central new york some like area that is blessed yes. by the spiritualists yes. somehow yeah some and burned then, over district exactly village. and we'll all have different houses that will you know we'll be like all in the same lot but all mm -hmm. different houses mm -hmm. so we have mm -hmm. some privacy whatever you mean we're and not gonna be sister wives well, we are. Uh, well, I don't know. I like to have sex with people. But, but no single guy. We we'll just, yeah. it's, yeah. it's just, I'm kidding. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> just, no husband. Just, no husband. <laughs> just the white um, part. Just the white. Oh, oh, yeah. Then fine. Yeah. Um, Cut out the middleman. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I, I just think I come from a 
mother who is a germaphobe already in a very unhealthy, ridiculous kind of way. And so I guess I worry, you know, I'm not a germaphobe because I, in reaction to what my mom does, I'm purposely like, ah, I'm going to be dirty, you know, um, or I try to be. And um, I do worry sometimes about that whole thing, like being mm-hmm. very neurotic about germs yeah. and stuff like that. Yeah, definitely. I'm a very, I have OCD. I'm a very neurotic person, not about cleanliness, but I do worry about my kids if they're going to just be like completely dysfunctional because they can't, they can't get over the idea that there's going to be germs and stuff. That's, yeah. that's the main thing I'm worried about. No, I think that's a, it's a reasonable thing to worry about at this point. Right. All right. Are you ready for the next one? What has podcasting taught you about your approach to communicating history to the general public? Wait, what? Sorry. I wasn't that the listening. public are pieces of shit. No, I'm no, no, no. I'm kidding. I'm absolutely kidding. <laughs> I'm obviously kidding. Um, oh my God. No. So it's, podcasting has changed the way that I do history, the way that I tell history stories, the way that I teach, the way that I uh, think about the value of history, right? It's not, it's not something that I, that's stuck in a classroom. It's, it's for everyone Mm -hmm. and everyone needs it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. Definitely making it more of a of an everyday and accessible element and you know, I learning how to tell a narrative better, right? And learning how to be a better storyteller and I mm-hmm. don't have that down, but like it's a constant thing that I'm working on and I don't think without having to put it in this type of medium, I would have ever really thought about it as deeply as I think about it now. And so Mm -hmm. every time I'm writing an episode, I feel like I'm getting a little closer to that, to that Sarah ideal of being a really good kind of storyteller. But you know, it, it has to be engaging Mm -hmm. and it has to be accessible and, um, in some way, like relate to people's lives in some Mm -hmm. way or another, you know? so mm-hmm. that they, they care. Yeah, I th- I think that's a really key point for me. Um is that we had to learn how to present things. Like okay, so let me start that that answer over again by saying that one of the other things that we um from the very beginning said that we wanted to do as a podcast was to translate kind of academic history, like the real work of history and bring it to the public. We wanted to translate that from like, you know, things that are being published by university presses, which this is not a criticism of them, right? But to take that information um, that we think has helped us to grow so much and bring that to people who will otherwise never encounter that stuff, right? Mm -hmm. Um, I can't tell you how many conversations I've had with my mom where she's listened to an episode and she said, I had no idea. I've never heard that before. I can't believe that that is something Mm -hmm. that happened and I never learned it, right? Um, And that's because there's a disconnect um, that people are constantly working very hard to try to address, right? There's it, with you know we always have that like op-ed written by some fancy historian who's like we need to get out of our ivory tower like we already are like there's tons of people already doing that but that disconnect still exi- exists between like the scholarship that we're all doing and the public and so we had to learn not just how to talk about history to people because the history channel does that ostensibly right it's just not doing it well it's not doing it responsibly um and we wanted to tell all the other stuff, right? We didn't want to do like 50 episodes about Abraham Lincoln, <laughs> even though I could do that. <laughs> I mean, that um, sounds like right up your alley, but okay. I would, I would 100% <laughs> do that. I'm actually, I'm launching my own, my own yeah. podcast just on Lincoln. No. Um, you would do a whole episode just on his underwear. Right? I would. No, yeah. you, you, this is not a lie. I'm not right? kidding. Um, <laughs> uh, but you know, we wanted to take all that other stuff, right? And so we had to find a way to translate all this other stuff um, into things that people will actually listen to. And this is why I think Marissa's episodes in particular are so brilliant because you take things uh-huh. that 
in American history, American populations anyway, have never heard of, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Um, or something that even to me, I'm like, are you really going to do an episode? Like, what was that episode you did that was about like rent or something? <laughs> Wait, remember. what? <laughs> you did an episode that was about something very, oh, it was about advertisements in oh, yeah. job advertisement, the want ads, employment basically. agencies. Yeah. yeah like, like the beginning of employment like a agencies. Very boring episode. Right. But no, it was all about like boobs and no, it was, you're right. Prostitution kind of weird stuff. Yeah. <laughs> if you pitch that to the history channel, they would say there is no audience for that. No one wants to hear about 18th century want ads. Right. Yeah. Um, but they and, do though. Like I listen to other podcasts right. about true crimes. Cause I, I only listen to true crime podcasts and they'll talk about crimes in the 1800s. You know, I was just listening to one about the Chicago fire, um, in 1871, I think it was this massive fire. And they're talking about what the context was like, Oh, well at the time fire departments looked like this and building codes looked like this. And they're like, Oh my God, really? People, they were, people were shocked that that's what it was like. Um, and it's like, yeah, I mean, that's all stuff that I, I knew from doing my readings and all of that stuff. Um, it's people do care about that stuff. People are interested in that stuff. I think more, I think that we reach a broader audience than people who are interested in like, let's go down all of the Roman emperors one by one. Mm -hmm. There are certain people who love that for sure. Yeah. But I think that we reach people who didn't think they liked history. I mean, I have several friends who mm -hmm. Podcasts religiously who have never listened to any other history podcasts or even liked any history classes and they just listen to it to like make me feel better or whatever mm -hmm. and now they love it so I don't know I think it's just a different I think we're reaching people who are not normally reached yeah and who don't think of themselves as history people necessarily yeah. right 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 um and the other thing that I'll say is that by learning how to do that, and I learn it more each time I do an episode, but by learning how to do that, it has made me, an, I think, a much better teacher um, because mm. I teach particularly a lot of lecture classes. And so I have, I have little choice other than to communicate what I'm trying to teach students through basically what I do in an episode, right? Like talking at people. Um, and so I think I've gotten really good at presenting something that a student might come in the door and be like, why are we talking about this in a way that, um, is, ends up being compelling to them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and I, um, I'm really grateful for that, 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 yeah. you know, it's, it's made me a better educator. And it's made me a better writer. I also like that we don't dumb it down right but we have to we yeah. have one of the ways that it makes me a better writer is that i can't assume that anyone has any kind of specialization knowledge about any topic that we talk about so we have For to sure. cover a lot in a little bit of time yeah we're bringing or we're like communicating the analysis that really was well respected and up and coming historians are uh, putting out in the world that, that, that most regular people who don't have access to an academic library are never going to have access to. Um, and that's what I, I think is one of the most important things that we, that we do. Definitely. Okay. Next question. Yeah. Is your B Ave? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> There's some editing happening in our Google Doc right now. <laughs> we can't ever use a Google Doc without um, insulting each other just for fun. So, well, April, you crossed off a couple of these, though, that I think that are really interesting. Can I choose just one of the ones that you crossed off? I swear that it's not um, duplicating. Is I'll roll two of them together. Is what is either one historical misconception that you wish people knew about? Or what's one interesting thing that you didn't know about a time period or a topic that, that you um, wrote an episode about, that you learned? You asked for permission and then you did it anyway. So Yeah, yeah. I did. It's mm -hmm. dinner time. So I learn, I mean, I definitely learned from doing podcasts, but I really learned being paired up with other people. Um, you know, and like, I'm thinking of the underwear episode that you did, Marissa, like, like that was, I loved that episode and I loved doing it. And I learned, 
you know, so much stuff that I didn't know had I not been on that episode or even like the, what was it like? Good guns, guts and blood or it was like the rise of, huh? The one, the rise of like medical bureaucracy or something like that. Oh, the military revolution. Yeah. But yeah. Yeah. Like I know what a military revolution was. So for me, it's like, it's learning from, from you guys. Um, and then of course, when I dive into, you know, a topic that I may know a little bit about, but when I'm doing an episode, like, you know, I, I deep dive into it, which is of course nice, but I really like being exposed to, I don't know, some world history that otherwise I just would never you know, venture upon myself or whatever. I personally think that you are a European slash world historian at heart because I think your style um, is much more similar to the styles of European historians, more analytical and less narrative than American historians. So I've always thought that it makes you wonder how we choose, how we choose our fields. I mean, it, ma- it makes me wonder that because mm-hmm. I think in a lot of ways, like you seem like a Europeanist to me or, you know, I don't know, in certain ways it's, it's yeah, interesting. Nah. What? <laughs> I said, yeah, nah. <laughs> yeah, I am not. Okay. <laughs> All right. Any more questions? And you're not going to answer that one. Anyone else? Oh, sorry. Um, for me, something that I constantly, (coughs) sorry, that I constantly impress upon my students. And I think I say a lot in the podcast is that I think a lot of times our understanding of history, at least at the very, um, at the popular level. So just what your average Joe knows about history is very so much um, colored by Victorian historians who have kind of understood history in a certain way. Um, And, you know, just like Sarah said, you know, oh, like, um, you know, everybody's kind of in their own little thing. So post-war U.S. historians will say, oh my gosh, like during World War II, it's the first time women were in the workforce. And it's like, no, women have been in the workforce for fucking ever. It's just the first time they were in the workforce since you know, for 10 years or whatever. It's like not yeah, since World War One. Um, yeah, like <laughs> since World War One. Um, so uh yeah, I think for me it's um encouraging people to kind of get out of that box a little bit. Um and um not Victorianize everything. A lot of just regular folks I, I listen to people who don't have anything to do with history who do true crime podcasts and they'll say like oh, well, back in the day, you know, you couldn't do this or you couldn't do that or people couldn't see your ankles or whatever. It's like, you know what? The 18th century was like one of the raunchiest centuries, Mm -hmm. um, you know, in time. Um, And my mom even called me and said, oh my God, like I just watched this because of quarantine, she's just watching Netflix all day. She's like, I just watched this thing about King Louis the 15th. And he just like, had sex with people in front of other people and then the men were having sex with other men and like the women were having sex welcome with to each France. other and i was like that is literally 18th century france <laughs> or welcome like that is literally what it is like yeah, that is what yeah. court life was like yeah. um but she didn't know because she thought yeah. okay well my parents were all prim and proper and they were you know born in 1930 so obviously before that people were even more prim and proper right um, and, and, and no also because works. people think that it it's um that history moves in a in a linear, linear. fashion right. towards like freedom mm-hmm. <laughs> right mm-hmm. which yeah. is not the case right it's like it's the it's all. actually the jeremy baramy um it's all over the place it, it goes backwards and forwards and things progress and then they go back right again. pendulum so. swings right. right i mean we're much more conservative yeah. now than you know as a country than we were in the 1950s yeah and this Maybe. is like marissa you always say like the, it's the kids these days argument right like oh we're God. continuously coming back to that it right? drives me crazy yeah <laughs> because these days, it's like no people have literally been saying that forever <laughs> got very violent i know well Whacked i mean i i've read you know 17th century treatises of people being like oh my god kids these days they go to like <laughs> oh yeah go at dances and i'm like everybody calm down <laughs> 
It's what the entire Puritan sex episode is about. But yeah, that's <laughs> all it is about is right. that everybody does the kids these days thing. Right, right, right. Um, I'm not going to fall prey to that. Um, if I can answer this question, I'll answer it very quickly, I promise. Um, which is that uh, I was... The, the actual question phrases it, is there something that astonished you? And I have to say, when I was doing the research for the, um, the ghost dance episode, I was truly astonished because yeah. I had been teaching the, the Indian Wars and Wounded Knee um, in one particular way that I, I had read. Like, I didn't, it didn't leap from my brain. Like, it came from scholarship that I had read. And then I read this, this uh, new book um, about sort of how progressive the ghost dance religion was. And it just, it, it truly was not something I had ever thought of before or encountered in anything else I had ever read. And it just really blew my gourd. Um, totally changed the way that I thought about that um, time period and about that event. Um, and about even in some ways, Native American, 19th century Native American history, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so again, that's one of the reasons that I love doing this pro project so much is because I think in my normal day-to-day -day life, um, especially once you get into like, okay, I've taught this class before I've got the lectures down. Like you're just not reading outside of your field. You, you yeah. just don't, you don't have the time for it. You don't have the energy for it. It doesn't have the uh, reward. I'm not saying nobody does or you, you never will, but like the impetus for like picking up that book about, you know, baseball is not there necessarily. Cause you've got seven books that just came out about you know, the civil war that you've got to get through yeah. so that you know what you're talking about in your field. Right. Yeah. And this podcast has made me, um, so much broader, uh, Agreed. in ways that I, I think are, um, really awesome. Totally agree. I am awesome is what I'm saying. No, not really. <laughs> okay. You ready for another one? Last one. Which one? No, last two. These are quick ones They're Yeah. What are your favorite history podcasts? If you listen to them, because not all of us do. <laughs> Full disclosure, everyone. I don't listen to history podcasts. I just make them. I'm sorry. Same. I don't listen to them regularly. I like American history tellers. I like uncivil. Sometimes mm -hmm. I like history chicks, but I'm not a regular mm -hmm. listener. Um, yeah. I, I would say I'm not actually, oh, I'm sorry, Marissa. No, go ahead. Go ahead. Um, I'm not uh, a, a super big history podcast listener either. Um, although I would say that I, I listen to individual episodes. Like I might not listen to right. like every single episode as they come out, but I will listen to individual episodes, especially if it's something that I'm really curious about it or that I am trying to work into like a lecture. I'm like, Oh, right. I need, I'm like walking to the library. I need something like to explain, I don't know, something about Greek history, history to me really quickly. But other than that, I really loved backstory, which I know is kind of coming to its conclusion right now. I learned a lot from backstory and I use backstory a lot. Um, Uncivil was fantastic. And I've used that on many syllabuses um, we should give a shout out to our friends at footnoting who do really great work too. Mm -hmm. um, footnoting is the first history podcast or actually it's the first podcast ever that I listened to. Uh -huh. um, I yeah. mean, years ago when podcasts weren't like a thing and right. I, that's the only history podcast I listened to and I, yeah. I loved it. Um, and we have lots of colleague podcasts at recording history that are all fantastic. And I will, you know, Again, I, I look to them when I need something to fill in a, an assignment for one week in a, in a syllabus. So um, I don't listen to them all the time, but I definitely, you know, rely on them. I will say that I assigned a couple of podcast options to my class this year, and I listened to episodes from them before I assigned them. And my favorites were Cocaine and Rhinestones, which is the history never of heard of that. Sounds country, amazing. Sounds country, awesome. Country music. Yeah, it's country Wait a minute. Music. How have I oh, never country heard music? of this? No, this is never like mind. Bye. Literally yeah, that's like my totally life. Up there's alley, right? yeah. yeah. See ya. Yeah. Sarah, you should Cocaine and rhinestones? Yeah, yeah. Cocaine Okay, and I'm downloading that now. Um, and also Nice Try Utopian, which is all about utopian societies. Oh. Um, I, I listen to podcasts all day, every day, and it's always true crime 
for the most part, but I do listen to a few history podcasts and those are um, history that doesn't suck. I really, really love it. It's, it's really good. It's American history. So I might not have the, the breath that, that um, I feel like I want, but it's um, really, really good storytelling. Um, mm-hmm. And I really enjoy it. Um, and it is um, done by a history professor who is trying to make history accessible just like us. And I really admire that. Mm-hmm. Um, and then History Chicks, I have always loved. That's probably the second podcast I ever listened to in life. They've been around for a very long time. I think since the early 2000, like maybe 2010. I mean, they've been around for a while. Um, and so that was probably the second podcast I ever listened to. Um, footnoting, I also loved. I just, uh, they had a really they have like a, a lot of producers and they had a lot of changeover of producers and each specialized in different things. So, um, over time it would be a bit of an ebb and flow as to what I was interested in. There was someone for a while who was doing all like Napoleonic stuff. And I was like, yeah, that's my jam. Um, and then sometimes, (laughs) sometimes it would change. Um, so that's all just, um, content related, but history chicks is, I still listen to every single episode that comes out. Um, they are not historians at all, but I, I grant them the, <laughs> the title of honorary historians. I don't know if I have the power to do that, but they're really, really good. And um, their sources are um, incredible and everything is very, very well researched and it's biographically based. Um, but I know that um, Susan and Beckett, who are the, the hosts that they read, like, I mean, up to a dozen books per episode. It's it's apps. It's super intense. So I really love them. Mm-hmm. Um, and they talk cool. about women, which is cool. They're Andy Oakley right. episode, one of the best episodes ever. Awesome. Okay. Last question. What are the dream topics that you would like to cover that you haven't yet covered on dig? Hmm. It's so hard. Long. It pause. is hard because like we can pretty much do whatever we want. So <laughs> I can't. Yeah, <laughs> we shut saying. yours down. Every time, time I'm like, I'm gonna do this episode about the Civil War, you're all like, uh <laughs> <laughs> poor Sarah. I don't know. I don't want to say something and then like lock myself in <laughs> and then yeah. be like, oh crap, now I really have to write that episode. I mean, uh, I just want to no, talk about a, like porn and stuff. Question. If if I yeah. like honestly. I would love to do just a porn series. And I mean, if you've seen 18th century porn, it's, it's great. It's ridiculous. I mean, it's, <laughs> I love it, but it's, it's absolutely insane. And it makes you wonder if these people have ever seen people have sex because it's like, that's <laughs> not how that works. I've Is talked to all porn is. Yeah. I mean, yeah, no, you're right. But Brian Watson, I've talked to him. Uh, I've talked to him about it, about like 18th century porn. It's like, what's going on here? Like the, they're not using perspective. Like nothing is like nothing. And, he, and, and they're like, yeah, that's just, you know, how 18th century porn is. So I would say porn. Um, hundred percent. I would say not so much a topic, but it, in a future where I have more time, I would like to again, try an experimental episode with sort of the highly produced with mm. uh, sound effects and stuff and music like yes. we did with the, um, get lit the Victorian household. Yeah. 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 That one. And then the one Love it. with, um, uh, progressive Christians with we Mark. Had, oh, Mark. we had a guest producer. Yeah. 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 Mm-hmm. That one had a lot of Mark. It's same as Mark, right? Am I just making yeah. that up? No, Mark, yeah, Mark Lemke. Mark Lemke. Yeah. yeah, Mark Lemke. Yeah, that was a great episode. Those mm-hmm. are those are it cool was good. episodes. But yeah, like April said, like that's a lot of time mm-hmm. in a future far, far from here. When we can afford to hire a, uh, a an editor and producer. Hey, that will be me actually because I'm 100 percent unemployed. Yeah, so when we can I will... afford to pay ourselves. Hello. Yeah. So once we're we can afford to to pay me. Um, yeah, we can, I would love to, yeah, that I would love to do contributors more often, um, and follow the, the, um, the layout of like nursing Cleo. I just, I really admire that the, the whole Mm -hmm. kind of like, you know, um, regular contributor versus 
Mm -hmm. ad hoc contributor sort of thing. Mm -hmm. That would be great. That would be awesome. That would be interesting. And it would certainly broaden our horizons a little bit in terms of what kinds of stuff we could present. Right. Oh yeah. Um, Like right now we, we certainly try really hard to do episodes that are global and transnational and things like that. Um, But there's language problems, you know, there's language barriers like Avril in your Japan eugenics episode, right? Like there's only so much research you can do because you don't, speak or read Japanese. Um, Correct. Yeah. You know, that, I came that, across that in my, um, in the episode I just did about Rico Jamiento. It's like right, 99% right. of the scholarship is in Portuguese or Spanish. Right. And I came and across I that in my Holocaust episode. Yeah, I don't um, speak those. <laughs> right. I think if I was, I don't know, I have a hard time answering this because I feel like I get so often to do dream topics, right? Yeah. Like things that you're like, oh, I just really want to know about that. Yeah. Um, I think that gaps that I have, like things that I would like to do more of, um, I want to do more Native American history and um, Western history in general. Yeah. Because that's something that we've done a few episodes on, but I would like to have more coverage on that. And I really loved getting to do that episode as, as it was one of the most difficult episodes I did, but on disability in the Holocaust. Um, but it, it it sparked a desire to do more sort of um, World War II and and kind of Nazi history, Holocaust history um, in general. Just partly because I just want to learn more of it. Um, mm. But there are lots of there are lots of things I still want to cover. I still wish Elizabeth did an episode about um, the printing presses in the Southwest that you did your article oh, about. Oh yeah. Like I, I well, that kind have, of stuff, right? <laughs> the Southwest is like, I mean, like, no, I think the Southwest is an area that is like booming yeah. mm-hmm. right now in terms of yeah. um, academic. Well, I and, shall do more of that. <laughs> I mean, I just, I just think it's super interesting. Um, yeah. And in a place that's kind of neglected, I think just because of a little bit less population. It's funny because I feel like I've done like three or four Borderlands episodes already. So I don't want to like. <laughs> you have. No, you, no, you have. It. But I think a lot of them are with um, history buffs with, with Dan, right? Yeah. Weren't they? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Maybe so. I don't know. Yeah. I, I don't mean, know. Moving great. forward, I definitely want to do some more, um, like, I need to push myself further into the 20th century. So I really want to look at some, like, you know, uh, the feminist movement in the 60s, mm-hmm. 70s, the mm-hmm. Black Panther movement, Black Power. Mm-hmm. Um, those we are we do have sort of a dearth of 20th, late, like later 20th yeah. century. Which is crazy because yeah. I love 20th century yeah, history. Yeah, me too. Like mm-hmm. I teach it all the time. I mean, that's what I'm, t- I'm teaching 20th century history right now. And you, it's just, right. You write like sixties feminism, civil rights movement, black Panthers, black power, all that. It's yeah. We don't have, we don't have that. Yeah. So I'll be teaching, I'll be teaching that next year. So that's kind of where I'm thinking too. Nice. So I'll be kind of leaning that direction. Hopefully. Yeah. I'm looking forward to it, and I hope I'm on the episodes with you because I love that stuff. Well, and I was thinking I would do that for this last sex episode, but then April made me do something on Niagara Falls. <laughs> <laughs> That's about the 20th century, sort of. April no, no, no. It was fun. I, I learned. I learned things from it. I, I'm, I'm glad, and I, you know, I was thinking I'm about like hear it. the honeymoon and like post-war honeymoon and you know nuclear families cool. and sex and oh my god, you know, I can't. I can't heterosexuality, know. like it's, it's kind of cool. So I like it a lot. It's a good yeah. episode. I'm really looking forward to it. Coming soon. And that's a great place to wrap this baby. It is. <laughs> yeah. Perfect. So here, here's our 99th episode coming live to you. And next week, uh, the next episode you listen to will be our 100th episode. Uh, we're revisiting our sex series because that was the first series that we launched as Dig uh, three What's years ago. What's the first ago. step? What's Ooh. the first step? What's the first episode up? It's probably going to be, why not? We'll just, we'll give them the one that's been previewed here. The 1950s and early 19th century honeymoon. There we go. The Niagara Falls. A little, a little New York, uh, a little New York state history. New so York and yeah, the honeymoon. Canadian. Well, and in doing it, I was like, oh, I'm talking about Canada a lot. We haven't ever done anything Canadian history. <gasps> I did a French Canadian episode. Canadian but oh, you did. Only one. Right. It's the only, I mean, there's only one that we yeah. did. Yeah, we need to do more Canada. Yeah. Oh, technically, we do. We need some Canada. 
technically Northwest Passage was. I was also thinking Canadian. that's the one I was thinking. Mm-hmm. Of. Okay, mm-hmm. never mind. Give you Very credit. Whatever. Speaking. We're about to have our third with the Niagara Falls episode. So yes. that's thanks for joining us. All those of all those of you who joined us for the live recording, thank you for coming. Yes, it's a pleasure to like talk to people's faces in addition to each other. Yeah. We see too much of each other and not enough of you all uh thank you uh for supporting us through these three years it's been a wild ride it's been a joy to bring this history to you and we will continue to do so so long as we can breathe and use these microphones and computers and the world so long as we can breathe okay we're well that's not this till we shouldn't the end. take that for granted right now <laughs> yeah. 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 don't actually quote me for that, on that okay one. all right yeah um you can follow us if you aren't already on Twitter, Facebook. You can uh, join our Himalaya member community uh, on the Himalaya app, which is a really handy dandy uh, app to uh, get access to all your favorite podcasts like you would on sort of Apple podcasts or google play but instead of just seeing the episodes you can actually sort of get special member content like all of our episodes ad free um you can uh if you're an educator you can check us out on lyceum another new podcasting app uh, that curates educational podcast lists so if you are teaching about the great depression there's probably a curated list in there for you um these you're an are, educator or even yeah. if you're a parent who is suddenly crisis homeschooling yeah for sure. <laughs> so uh thanks again for listening thanks for sticking around with us these three years and we look forward to many years more and many hundred more episodes yeah um, to come <laughs> to 100 more, Woo! 100 more. Woo! we love you bye bye, bye.